Season 2 Finals, round of 16, I won't say round of 32, but we already wrapped that one up a couple of weeks ago. I'm Kevin Van der Koy, also known as Rotterdam. With me is Pek, and we are getting ready for our first series of Group D. Absolutely, it's going to be an awesome, awesome match coming up here. Two veterans of, uh, yeah. of long ago, both strong Brood War players, both Rhett and Stardust, going to be facing oh. off here. I didn't know Sardis was a Broodwar player. You're teaching he, me things over here. Yeah, yeah, he played for uh, quite a long time. Didn't really have a breakout performance, but uh. Uh, we saw, of course, he moved over to America and then took a chance in Switzerland. And we saw him break out in 2013, suddenly win a DreamHack, steal it away from Jadong, and just go on a, a huge, huge string of success from there. So what you're telling me is Stardust' MMR in Broodwar was never high enough to run into me. Never. As never. a Warcraft 3 player, Not you started off as like B plus and IC <laughs> Cup, I heard. This is how difficult Warcraft was. Anyway, this should be a really fun series. Of course, it's always fun for me to cast someone from the Netherlands here in the round of 16. Our very own Red, Joste Krohn. It's been a long time since he's made it this far in WCS Premier League. And I really did have a good feeling. It was kind of funny because I jokingly uh, spoke with him about this last week. And I was like, Red, I really had the feeling this time you were going to go to the round 16. And then he looked at me. He's like, you always have that feeling about me. I was like, no, no, no. This time I was for real. He's like, well, he's like, thank you, I guess. Uh, but I go... He's going to go up against Stardust over here in the round of 16 in his first series. Stardust, of course, um, a player that has a lot of work to do when it comes to perhaps the race to BlizzCon. He has made it to BlizzCon before. He would love to do that all over again, but looking at that current rank, he's been missing out on some very, very variable points in Season 1. Abs uh, absolutely. You know, missing out on Season 1 because he could not get his visa finalized just in time. Uh, so he's ha kind of having to come into the season late, and it's such a handicap. When you're talking about three seasons in a year, you mm -hmm. miss out on one of those, you've got to make the next two seasons count. So this is a defining point in Stardust's year, and for yeah. him, not making it to BlizzCon would be a disaster. In, in his mindset, he has to make it to BlizzCon. That is why he's moved his entire life to the US. He's changed up everything to get the best practice over there. On the other end, we got the red, Jos de Kroon, representing Team Liquid for the first time since 2013, I believe, that he's made it to the round of 16 in Premier League once more. He's always been around. He's basically been one of the top players in Europe since day one of the beta. But there has been times, especially, you know, let's say in the middle of last year, that people didn't count red as a top player in Europe anymore, you know? If you would name five Zergs, often they would name five different Zergs than red. That's kind of unimaginable when you think about this player. He won the European Battle.net Invitational in 2011. He was around since the very get-go. Even in 2012, he had deep runs in DreamX back then, in Intel Extreme Master events as well. Gamer Assembly, he won too. But 2013, 2014 was just not really the period of red anymore. And, you know, like even some of the casters, I, I, had thought, I overheard a conversation the other day with Todd and Red, and Todd is like, well, uh, Red, no offense, but I really did not expect you to go this far. And like Red just kind of looks at me and he's like, well, thank you, I guess. He's like, <laughs> he's like, no, I don't mean it wrong. It's just like, it really kind of felt like you were getting, you know, ready to move on, move away from StarCraft. And suddenly Red bounced back and he's been looking really, really good over the last few weeks. Not just in WCS, but even winning the Hell about the Hell It's About Time qualifier as well. Qualifying for another event in Toronto. It's a good, uh, good time to be a Red fan, I'd say. I'm, absolutely. He's just been... Uh plowing through the opponents and we actually saw in his uh, challenger match mm -hmm. very surprisingly took down Welmu there with a 3-2 win Welmu being a, a mainstay in, in the high ranks and since then just creaming his way through his uh, round of 32 group we do see those uh, vetoes coming up on screen interestingly Coda picked map one for Stardust Vani picked map two for Rhett and map three is Iron Fortress what do you think of those picks I'm not actually too surprised. Like, I know that Red is not a big fan of Cactus Valley, and Echo is the easiest map for Protoss out there to truly stabilize on three bases. So I think this is actually kind of standard, especially with Coda being the first map. I think Coda is truly going to be a very standard map. Almost every single Protoss plays very straight up on Coda. Then again, Stardust has never really been every single other Protoss. Like, Stardust has always been Stardust with his go-to builds. Uh, I had actually the opportunity to talk a little bit with Stardust yesterday. And I was like, you know, how do you feel? Like three Zergs. He's like, well, on one end, it's very nice because I only have to worry about one matchup. He's like, on the other end, I feel if I want to make it out of this group, I have to win the first two series immediately because PVC has always kind of been a matchup of Protoss wants to do something and hope the Zerg isn't ready, right? And Stardust is like, the more I have to play, the more I'm going to expose my builds, the more ready my opponents will be, and most likely the weaker my strategies will become because I'm going to do things that I don't necessarily want to do. So Stardust is looking for a victory here. He wants to win his first two games, he wants to win a winner record, and he wants to be done with his group and get ready for some different matchups.
He d definitely doesn't want to show too many of those plays. Mm. And we saw in his round of 32, as you said, Stardust is not a standard Protoss player. He's never going to fall back on that defensive-oriented play. Instead, he's much more focused on aggression. Very, very odd plays. I think he's almost a nightmare to play against as a Zerg player. And yeah. as Rhett studying an opponent like Stardust, you've got to be thinking, what do you prepare for exactly? Because this is a guy who's known to give false information, to yeah. cancel buildings, to do a lot of proxies. Stardust has an absolutely immense range of builds, mm -hmm. and uh, it's very hard to prepare for that. Yeah, I've had multiple events with Red over the last few weeks, so I had plenty of time to talk with him, which obviously helps me a little bit as a caster, because suddenly I can sound really smart. And you know, like uh, we've been talking about it, and Red just said he's not 100% sure what to expect. On one hand, he's kind of expecting very standard, you know, Blink, Stalker, Storm, but I was like, I really don't think so, man. Like, I, I think with Stardust, you're going to have to expect a couple of different things. He's going to do some wonky, strong two-base timing. He's going to scout. He's going to try to throw you off. There's a good chance he's going to go for a heavy gateway push in one of the games. Like, Stardust has never been, once again, the guy that just does what everybody else does. He's always at least giving his own twist to things and sometimes just playing in a very unique way. And I think we're going to see that as well. But once again, we're going to focus on map number one. It is Coda. I feel like if there is one map where we're going to see the regular, the standard meta, as we like to call it, the Blink Stalkers, Storm, Plus Two, from Stardust, it has to be on Coda, right? It's definitely a map for it. You know, it's quite easy to shut down that third base uh, with your Blink Stalkers defense. Uh, that being said, in the round of 32, this map, Stardust was very fond of it, and he really liked doing a specific build where he built a robotics in his wall at his natural yeah. very early every game and went for very fast warp prism harass, and it felt like from there he was always playing by feel with different little reactions and twists and turns. I mean, we've seen a lot of cool things as well from Zergs on Coda, which, uh, you know, one thing that I really like is something I saw for Snoot the other week is where you go for the double Roach one star, and I know it's slightly already falling out of fashion, but the coolest thing about the double Roach Warren is not obvious that you just get tunneling claws and you try to overrun your opponent, but Protoss will often set himself in defensive positions. You show your Roach on one side, the Protoss drops force fields because like, oh god, I need force fields, and then you just run away, and then suddenly the force fields work against the Protoss because Protoss wants to bring those forces over to fight on the right side, and suddenly you can't get there anymore. Uh, I, I definitely think there is a good chance we'll see something a little bit crazy out of red, but... I've seen him play quite a few ZVPs on Coda, and I kind of feel that he has faith in his Hydra timings, in just like the Roach Hydra, trying to hope that the Proto slightly messes up with the Forest Fields, and then just overrun him with Macro, because I kind of feel that's still what Red is good at. Absolutely. Rhett's a player who powers out the drones. He can hit those timings a lot stronger than a lot of other players because he gets that economy up so fast. And mm -hmm. To some extent, you'd often situate yourself in a more of a defensive stance as a Zerg player against a player like Stardust, right? You'd think, if I can just scout what's up, what's going on, defend it, I can maybe get ahead because Stardust's usually not going to be going for that super efficient fast third base. Yeah, I was looking around a little bit. Stardust seems to be pretty ready to hop into his first series of the day over here in the round of 16 as Red is still having minor issues with his hotkeys, which should be resolved real soon, and then we can just go ahead and hop into the games. While we're waiting for this game to start pick, any highlights so far? What's your favorite game of the day? What's really stood out for you? I think uh, Gung Fu taking that first set against 4GG was a big surprise for a lot of people. I think that was pretty cool. But uh, I, I also just loved, and I, it wasn't the closest games, but what I really liked, because Hydra's a player I'm really following in this tournament, mm -hmm. and I think he can take it out, was the way he played that first series of the day against Bunny. I feel like it was so intelligent the way he played, rushing a lair out and really abusing Bunny with the play styles he played. It just, it was an impressive way to take Bunny out of his element and not really give him the chance to have a fair fight. Now, I was uh, casting actually over here on the Beast stream while the series was going on and it did peek over every now and then because the stalker of Attic that I am and you know, watching one series is not enough. It's like, I'm casting, but it's still like I'm at home and I have two screens because over there I see the main screen. I saw both games were quite long. So like, what was the one thing? Like, uh, Actually, what I want to ask is, as a Bunny fan, do I still have a lot of hope that Bunny can make it out of this group? Did he play very well? Was it just Hydra elevating his play to the next level? Or should I be worried as a Bunny fan? I think uh, Bunny never really got a chance to get into his element. Really? So I think uh, Hydra played very intelligently. He kind of anticipated how Bunny was going to play to a certain extent. In the first game, we saw him actually really just, just rush Mutalisks before even getting Zergling speed. Like a really like, I'm going to take advantage of you build. And uh, likewise in the second game against Bunny's mech, he just kind of picked away at the edges. 
But I think it was more a story of Hydra playing intelligently, Hydra playing smart and dominatingly, rather than Bunny falling apart. So I think Bunny's still got a very good shot of making it out of mm -hmm. that group, but it's going to come down to his TBT against 4GG. Now, if you guys are wondering, if you just joined us and wondering what we're talking about, of course, a couple of the games that have been played early today. No groups have been played out yet. We have a couple of players already making it through through the round of eight, of course. Uh, we saw Hydra on the start of the day. He won Group A. Did Group B finish up? Uh, no, right? No, that's going on right No, We've been darting between... What uh, was Group B then? Group B, of course, is the one with uh, Polt, Harstam, Marine, Lord, but and Firekick is Group B. No, but then that one should have been already resolved, because right now we're playing as something of... Oh, yeah, that's the winner, Brad. The, uh, I don't... I believe we're finishing the groups today. I believe ah, we're so. just playing a couple of the matches. Okay, I was just wondering what's happening in Group C then. No, that's right. So the winner's match of Group B is currently going on in the mainstream. After that, we should have the winner's match of Group C as well. Absolutely. And then yeah. uh, much later, we're going to have the winner's match of Group D. Of course, later today, there's going to be some Archon mode action over here as well. There's a lot of interesting teams signing up. I already know that uh, Zombie Grub and Rifkin are uh, teaming up together. I've the seen them play Arkham, though. They're actually pretty scary together. So The base trade team, uh, guys. Yeah, 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 the base trade team. I think it's going to be quite fun. Uh, I'm hyped for that as well, especially because oh, yeah. I haven't seen too much Legacy lately. I've seen a little bit, but I've actually... Uh, for some weird reason, like, the more I start playing Heart of the Storm, the more I like it. I guess after all the frustration, you finally get a little bit better, and then suddenly it's so rewarding, and you're like, this game is really fun. And then there you are know, some <laughs> people who's like, oh, I'm just really waiting for Legacy. It's like, no, you're doing it wrong. Just <laughs> play more leather, and the game will be more fun. It's a game yeah. like that, isn't it? It's, it's a little yes. bit punishing, but there's a lot of new things in Legacy to play with. I recently got to play a bunch of Protoss playing an Archon show match mm -hmm. along, alongside Park. And it's yeah, really and I heard you did really well. I saw that. I don't know if you were in charge of the Disruptors, but I saw a couple of great detonations <laughs> there. Yeah, it was actually. It was pretty much my only job. It was 95% Puck controlling, and I got the job of, you know, control the harassment units, which yeah. is it's what, it's what's great about Archon mode. And even when you lose games, it's, it's hilarious because it devolves into miscommunication yeah. and you're kind of like, wait, I thought you were defending. No, you're defending. <laughs> it's, it adds this really cool team aspect to it. And it just, it's a lot of fun. Even when you're losing, you're getting smashed. It's hilarious. It's so much fun. <laughs> I, I've actually uh, I've played a little bit of Arkham mode. As, uh, one more update about Group D. The winners' match is coming up real soon, guys. We're not just talking about Arkhamut over here because we want to bore you to death. Uh, but we're still waiting. I think Redis hotkeys are all right right now, but I believe Stardust is the one that's currently rebooting his PC. So hopefully we can hop into Code R real soon and we can just talk about things that we know best. And that is a little bit of PVZ. We got the Protoss, we got the Zerg, we got Discovered. Should be a really fun uh, matchup. But I played a little bit of Archon mode with Nathan, the good old Nathan, Fabricas, Nathanius. <laughs> And then people are like, well, you guys must really work really well together, right? Because you cast all these games. The answer is no. Like, <laughs> we were atrocious together, Pig. Like, because, like, we, you know, when we played Protoss, Nate just had no idea what to do. And I was like, I almost felt like, you know what? I should just be playing 1v1. Then we started playing Terran, and Nate is like, I got this build. You just take care of the medevac, and I do the rest. My build is really good. And by the time he gave me his medevac, I fly into missile turrets and steam marines. I was like, Nate, this build is really not good. And he's like, why would you lose the medevac? You have one job. I was like, Nate. I was like, they're ready for it. This is so obvious. You know, so we were not the greatest Arkham mode duo out there. And at a certain point, I was like, Nate, I think we should stick to 1v1. One one. He's like, yeah, that sounds like a plan after we lost like four games in a row. But you're right. It is fun. Exactly. Even when it's breaking apart friendships as you scream at each yeah, other across wow. the room. <laughs> we're still roommates, at least for now, so I think we're good. For now, yeah. Just don't play too much. Don't play okay. too much. As, we, uh, as we're still waiting for updates of Group D to start, I think we're just going to kick to a very small break. And as soon as Group D is live, as soon as we're loading into Coda, we'll be right back with the first best of three of Group D. So sorry for the uh, small inconvenience. Stay tuned. You're watching WCS Season 2 Finals.
Uh, welcome back to WCS Season 2 Finals, live from Toronto, where this time, for real, we will jump into our very first versus three of Group D. It's going to be Stardust versus Red, Korea versus the Netherlands, Protoss versus Zerg, the way I love it, Vic. Oh yeah, one of the best matchups out there. Mm -hmm. The high-tech aliens slowly getting killed by the swarm of bugs. I mean, you have Slime and you have Shiny. Like, I think every person would, in his right mind would always go for Shiny. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, if you want to build pretty things, and go play SimCity. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I like lasers, okay? <laughs> I like claws, I like goo, I like putting, right. I like putting so, fungal growth. So think things. about the best parties you've ever seen. Did they have like a slimy show or a lazy show? You know, I've been to a really good jelly wrestling show before, uh, so... Uh, okay, I think I've, I've asked the wrong questions. All right, we're just going to talk about Protoss vs. Zerk from this point on. Go to our first map. We've already shared our thoughts a little bit. Of course, we want to encourage everyone to keep tweeting about the event as well. Hashtag WCS Toronto. And I believe you can vote on the matches as well, but I think that's only on the main stage. But currently, you can do like hashtag Marine Lord or hashtag Polt. As long as you also include WCS or hashtag WCS Toronto in yeah. your tweet, then your vote will count. It will be registered. You can have a small impact on the little bar that's on the, you know, moving on the bottom side of your screen, right, left, right, left. And that's what we love on Twitch TV. We love filling up progress yeah. bars, don't we? Oh, yes. All of those donation goals <laughs> that I've never had. There are a lot of things I do. So, you know, there, there, there is a lot of ways to sell out, but the, the, the donation bars is not really my thing. <laughs> I, if anything, I would have like a ladder progress bar, you know, it was like when I finally like level up or I finally like break into the top 100 or the top 50, like that should be like mission accomplished. Yeah, yeah. That, that is like, you can, you can make a bar out of that. Anyways, we are, uh, we are loading in. The first map is definitely not going to be Cactus Valley. It is going to be played on Coda. I'm really excited for this one. It's going to be a great series. Red has been on a little bit of a tail lately. He's been winning a lot, pretty much everything he participated in up to last weekend, where he finally suffered his first defeat in a while against a fellow Dutch player. But that player was a Terran. He doesn't have to worry about Terrans in this group. He only has to worry about this guy spawning on the left top side of Coda for our first best three in Group D. It is Stardust. And spawning down here in the bottom right, his opponent is going to be Liquid's Rat. Oh, of course, he doesn't only have to worry about Stardust. He has to worry about Jadong and Petraeus as well. How do you, you know, like, we're a little bit conflicted in this group because I'm obviously cheering a little bit for my Dutch brother. And you've got Petraeus in this group as well. I know it's not 100% the same, but it is from down under over there. Like, it's very, very far away. You know, there is like there is nothing close to New Zealand and your country, so he must kind of feel like your Zerg brother, right? Absolutely. New Zealand is pretty much a, a mini mini state of Australia. We like to claim <laughs> all their successful and famous people as our own. <laughs> and I really have picked this group actually as the one with the most likelihood of upsets to happen. Yep. Um, a lot of players just look at the two Korean flags. They they look at the the legacy of Stardust and Jadon and they say easy favorites. And I definitely agree they are the favorites. But not by that long a stretch. Rhett and Jadong both have a really great ZVP, really great Zerg vs Zerg. And I think we've got a good chance of upsets happening here. But a very interesting opening out of Rhett. Yeah, yeah I think Rhett is going to try to roll the dice here a tiny bit. And he will most likely uh, try to open up with a bunch of speedlings. Hoping that Stardust would perhaps go for a very greedy opening. Maybe a Nexus first on the low ground into a gateway on the high ground. But the opposite is true so far. Stardust has dropped the gateway. He doesn't um, take any assimilators yet. So it will most likely be a gateway into a Nexus. Which is still a strong economic build. Mm, do you think that Red is able to achieve anything with the links here? I have the feeling it's going to be quite difficult. It's a tough situation, you know, uh, there is no gas down for Stardust just yet. So with this Gate Nexus build, it's very, very safe against your early spawning pool, like your 9 pool, your 10 pool. But when you're going up against what Rhett's doing, it is a Zergling rush, but mm -hmm. it's with Zergling speed. It's a little bit later. It hits you with a big mob of speedlings, and it is going to be a little bit tricky for Stardust to hang on to that natural expansion. So how do you think it's going to play out right now? Because I, I, I still have the feeling that there is a chance, because like, if it would have been the other way around, because if you go Nexus into Gateway, that of course means that your Zealot is going to be later, that also means you have much later access to your Cybernetics core, and that means a much later Mothership core. With this build, the, the Gateway was already done, so everything else is going to be slightly quicker for Stardust, and I have the feeling that this should be holdable for him. I think he should be able to defend his Nexus on the low ground. I think technically it is. Uh, I think there's always a little bit of variance, but I do agree. 
That being said, it comes down as well to how much does Rhett commit to this. He may just pressure with this, but so yeah. far we do see a lot of speedling production out of him. Stardust being very good with this probe, he's going to know 100% mm. are you committing more to this because he comes in, he sees more Zerglings popping out, and that's the information he needs to know. Let's play really safe. Now, this is going to be very fun, actually. This makes PvZ a fun matchup because the openings are not always the same. There are so many ways this can play out, and even, like, you know, like we both play a ridiculous amount, and we still can't say for sure how this one will play out. I have the feeling that this should be doable for Stardust, but like you said, it all comes down to how much is Red willing to commit. Well, Red is going all out, man. He's like, okay, I've opened this way. My economy is not as great as yours. I want to kill this Nexus. And from this point on, it's going to be a very interesting dance between the Zerklings, between the Zalots, and between the Nexus. But of course, the longer he waits, the more chance there will be that Photon Overcharge will eventually be activated. And as soon as Photon Overcharge is activated, things are going to get very dicey. He gets his surround here on the Zealots, but he's going to lose a lot of Zerglings in the process. A little bit of a questionable trade there, only killing one Zealot for about 12, 13 Zerglings. And that really takes the oomph out of Rhett's force, throwing those Zerglings away. Now coming in again, trying to get these Zealots to finish them off. He is going to kill them. He needs and the Nexus, though. He, he needs to really start working on Nexus. Like, Stardust will be more than happy to trade Zealots for Zerglings for days in the current economic situation. 26 against 14, one more surround on the Nexus goes down. A couple of pros being pulled. Very well done so far by Stardust. I think Stardust is handling this the way he should. And Red is super all in with this, man. There is like no going back from this point. He's still producing Zerglings. It's gonna be, he needs to get damage done right now. There are no drones on that natural expansion. Stardust has so much money coming in. These Lings are committing against the Nexus Overcharge. That cannon is chewing through these Zerglings. Okay. And they I do have to pull out. Hmm, I think maybe that was the moment that he should have gone for it. I think Red will still go for it. He can't, he can't wait until Photon Overcharge expires. That is just going to be simply going to be way too late. He's working again on the Zealot. He takes care of the Zealot. He's going to try to run into the main base, but the sentry is blocking the Axis. This is really the moment he needs to kill the Nexus. And even if he kills it, I still kind of like Sardis' position. But if he doesn't kill it, I'm afraid that this is going to be it. I, I think this is almost game over. That is absolutely disastrous. Those Zerglings do not manage to take it down. Now there is a tight wall here at the natural expansion. Stardust has weathered the storm. He has defended the endless link. Onslaught, and we see Rhett now pulling back, beginning to lick his wounds, and types out that well, GG. GG is called, and just like that, Stardust gives a little nod to himself as he's like, hmm, I did not bad. Like, I did, I did that pretty well, right? Like, yes, Stardust, you did that very well because that is a scenario that it is, it is holdable as a Protoss, but it's not a given. You really have to do things right. And I really think it comes down, like moments like this, it often comes down to one key moment, one of the very first big fights, and it is that trade that you mentioned, the 12, 13 Zerglings that fell against just one Zealot, where the second Zealot was very low on HP, but that is just not a trade that Red can allow himself to make in that phase in the game. Like, if you decide to fight the Zealot, you have to be damn sure that you actually take them out. Absolutely, and uh, you know, that's a really pivotal moment there because it, it says something about the momentum in this series yeah. where when you throw an aggressive build like that and it, it really fails, uh, I guess, quite, quite decisively. I don't think Stardust ever really looked like he was in trouble. Yeah. It's really got to put an impact into Rhett's confidence. And we've got to remember, for Stardust, he's not going to settle for anything less than going through here. He needs to win this group, and he's got to be very happy with that, not showing any of his builds yet, going into the next game with yeah. a very strong position. And yeah. Red, he's going to have to really tighten his game up in this next this next one. I think you make a great point there. PvZ is often all about information, and Stardust was just able to pick up game number one and didn't give away anything at all. This is not a game that Petraeus can learn anything from. This is not a game that Jadon can learn anything from, other than the fact that he went gateway into Nexus. But nobody forces him to do that all over again. Next time, it could be a Nexus first. However, second map, Vani Research Station, a map that's going to play out very different, and a map where I think we're going to see Red do something very unorthodox. He's most likely going to be very aggressive with hatcheries. He's going to either do that or take gold bases. Either way, it's going to be crazy. All right, spawning here in the top, top of the map, we do have the blue Protoss player. It is Stardust. Stardust up 1-0 in this series. As the second map is, of course, on Vani. He's going up against a Dutch Zerg that's uh, representing Team Liquid and has been for a long time. It is Red. This is a map with many, many gold bases on it, and I think I agree with you that Rhett is going to be looking to do something special. Yeah, if I know Rhett, I think he's going to send out like his 12th or his 13th drone across the map, 
and he's going to build a hatchery at the bottom of the ramp of Sardos. That's kind of what I expect him to do. Uh, but I think he's just going to do it at the third base, not necessarily super close to the ramp. Uh, and I'm not sure where he wants to take it from there. I have the feeling that Red just wants to force his opponent in a very unorthodox game. You know, throw off the Frodo's build order, make the game different, and don't allow Stardust to just do what he normally does. Then again, I've been talking a little bit with Red, and he's not too confident in some of his builds, so maybe he's had, you know, a last-minute change of mind. And ooh, I see a Forge going down. Very interesting decision there from Stardust. And that is a very safe move against some of those aggressive proxy hatch builds, but it also gives him the opportunity to deny a very fast expansion. And look at the path this probe takes. It is heading towards that gold base, but Rhett does spot it in time. Now, is Rhett going to change his plan? No, he's just going straight for that hatchery. He's seen the probe coming, but he's still committing to it. This is very dangerous. If yeah. Stardust chooses to cannon rush this, Rhett will not be able to defend it. He will have to just take expansions yeah, elsewhere this, on the map. Yeah, this is actually, uh, this is also another map where you can just pull a couple of drones because, of course, the gold base, it's awesome for your economy, but it also means that it's very, very far away from all the drones that are currently mining at home. So this is not like an Echo or a Coda where you can just pull a couple of drones down the ramp and, you know, take care of these pylons, make sure the cannons won't go up, and then suddenly you're in a great position. Like, what I think if I would do if I were Red, I would just, like, try to force out as big of an investment as possible from my opponent and then cancel the hatchery at, like, the 99 second mark. But I think Sardis is even too good for that. He probably wipes in the additional cannons by the time he knows he can still cancel them if Red decides to cancel the hatchery. And Red still actually doesn't have vision on the cannons. He saw a probe coming, but he doesn't know 100% sure that this is what's happening, and he doesn't seem to have reacted to it. There is always that small chance that in the high-pressure situation, he was not watching his minimap because he just has not reacted to this cannon rush yet. He doesn't know it's there. His second overlord yeah, actually went on a very us. odd path with no other hatchery Oh, that's so them. smart. That is so smart by Stardust over there. Stardust shooting at his own ca uh, pilot for just a couple of seconds because he didn't want to reveal the cannon against Red. So Red's still not getting the alert, not seeing that his hatchery is under attack. We'll let this hatchery finish, and right on that moment, Stardust is like, all right, well, I think this would be a great time to stop shooting at my own pilot and actually start shooting at the hatchery. Really well done. Absolutely beautiful sneaky move there from him. Rhett countering now with the gold hatchery as well as taking the front base. He's just saying, I cannot react to this. I cannot stop it. Let's just let that hatchery die. Let's take two bases elsewhere and try to push our economy forward. Hopefully not being too far behind in that economy. But Stardust has, has to be happy with this scenario. When yeah. you've denied a base like that and he's got the probe scouting around, he sees how late the hatcheries are, he feels confident that he's ahead in this game. He is in the commanding position. I mean, on one end, I do kind of like it from Stardust because this is, of course, sort of what he wants out of it. But I think it's a Protoss. You always secretly hope for more. You kind of hope that the Zerg really mishandles it, right? Like he pulls a bunch of drones, the drones are not mining, and then suddenly, you know, either you get a couple of drone kills, or at least he loses a lot of mining time. And I think that's the ideal scenario. Since that didn't happen, in the end of the day, it's a pylon, and it's two cannons for one hatchery. I don't think it's the worst thing in the world for Red. As Red is still going to have a gold base in the end. Of course, it takes us a little longer to get this one saturated, but the cannons also slow down the gateway for Stardust, so I don't think it's all that bad. Stardust tech is definitely delayed quite a bit. Uh, he didn't go for the absolute fastest Nexus there, so you are right. Stardust is delayed, but because Rhett lost out on a huge amount of opportunity cost only now just starting to mine from a second base, he definitely isn't quite where he wants to be. He can still come back from this position for sure, though. Mm -hmm. It's going to be very interesting. Does Rhett go for these fast gases? He does. He's taking them now in the main. Going to be trying to get up some gas for some mobility on the map. Meanwhile, Stardust investing in that plus one upgrade on that forge. Could he perhaps follow up with one of those famous Stardust seven gate attacks? <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't really blame him. I don't believe there's a single probe currently out on the map for Stardust. And I kind of feel whenever you, you know, other than this one, but this one is in a little bit of a dire situation. Do you think he's going to make it home pick? No. Sorry, man. That it was, was really anticlimactic. It was so dire that he died. Yeah. It was a pretty hard situation. There. Stardust <laughs> actually dropping quite a late Stargate here. This is a, a kind of odd timing to drop that after investing in the plus one upgrade on that forge. It's a very interesting build order, and, and this is Stardust down to a T. He doesn't just follow what everyone else does. He makes up his own build orders. He trusts in them. Interestingly, at Rhett's gold base, we did see a bit of missaturation in that a lot of his drones were yeah. tripling up, while the top side of that base, actually the drones aren't spread oh. there. So a lot of these drones are queuing up 
find each other rather than being as efficient as they could possibly be mining on those northern minerals. Yeah, I think he's going to fix it right now, but that actually changes quite a bit. Having two drones on a mineral patch, that's not too big of a deal, but having three on one mineral patch, that does kind of sting. These two zealots won't be able to achieve all that much, but what they are able to achieve is forcing Red to deal with this and not necessarily worry about the next big thing that's on the way. And that, I want to say, is an oracle, but it's not. It's a void ray. And that Stalker coming in with the Zealot as well as the Mothership Core, he's forcing even more and more Zerglings out of Rhett. But Rhett is kind of getting pressured here, and because he doesn't have the Zergling speed, he doesn't have the Roach Warren down yet, he doesn't know what the next stage is. So he's stuck being pressured, being building slow Zerglings, but he has no idea what's the next step, and Stardust is just trying to be as annoying as possible. This is not an attack that needs to do a lot of damage, but it is forcing out a well, lot of Zerglings. I do think it needs to do a lot, though, for Stardust in the long run, because he doesn't have a Twilight, he doesn't have a robotics facility, no access to plus two whatsoever. So I actually feel that Stardust has to win the game with his gateway void ray attack. And the more queens that Red will get, like queens are actually phenomenal units against everything that Stardust currently had. He is up by three workers and he kind of gives us the idea right now that he wants to go up to three bases, but I feel like this is such a hard build to transition out of if you're Stardust. I absolutely agree. I think that's a fake Nexus. I think yeah. we can go so far. He's <laughs> actually continuing to build probes. Now, I wonder if that's a fake because there was an Overlord in the base, but he's not cancelling them. So many gateways and constant Void Ray production. There's going to be such a powerful Void Ray gateway timing coming. I think Stardust has got to commit to it. But looking at this, cleaning up Overlords, it puts Rhett in an awkward position. Rhett doesn't really know how yeah. much Stardust committing. And if you look at it, Stardust's work account is actually getting quite far ahead of Rhett's. Mm, of course, Rhett does have the gold base, so that kind of makes up for it. And I am still a tiny bit worried, because if we do get, let's say, 10, 12 Hydras out, I am not sure, like, oh, if Red can get one cancel on this Nexus, that would be so big, because that means that oh. the future Photon Overcharge is going to be delayed as well. This is a really, really, really important moment in this game. Will Red be able to force the cancel? There are a couple of sentries as well. They're going to probably drop a couple of force fields. Will Red get the cancel on the Nexus? I think he will. He does get it, and that is massive. That is absolutely huge. And the Zerglings are going to trap the sentries, getting the wraparound. Stardust's force is falling apart. This is an absolutely devastating fight. Rhett is controlling the pace of the game here now. And behind this, he's droning up really hard on the three bases. And that Hydra is then is finishing up. So that means he can start getting his Hydra upgrades. And if you take a look at the Stardust army right now, nothing that Stardust has is good against Hydra Lisk. Void Race, they melt against Hydras. Sentries, they're low on energy. Stalkers, he doesn't really have any yet. Uh, Colossus are miles away, Storm is miles away. I think this was key by Red. I think a lot of Zergs would just sit back and be like, you know what, as soon as I have like six Hydras, I'm going to try to go for that attack. But by then it would be so much harder because the sentries are going to be in position. There is Photon Overcharge. Red went for it and I think that was a game-winning move. Stardust now moving down with this somewhat desperate Void Ray maneuver, trying to get some damage done with the counterattack, maybe trying to snipe off a hatchery, but the Hydralisks are in position. <laughs> Yeah, SK has to be very careful. There's a good chance one of these uh, Foyders is going to go down. Hydras don't have speed yet, though, so even on creep, they looked very slow. I've never seen Hydras that slow, pick. Stardust moving in there now at the front. Of course, the <laughs> Hydralisks, they're pretty much the exact same move speed as when they have the upgrade when they are on creep, but it doesn't make too much difference, of course. Uh, Rhett now looking like he's in a very strong position, just content to mass Hydralisks, because what do you got from Stardust? You've got Blink, you've got Plus Two, you've got Immortals. None of those things are particularly great against Hydralisks. And with that gold base, with that economy advantage, with that new fourth base yeah. going up over there at the, the normal third base location, we can see Ret Supply climbing ahead. He's adding more drones. He's in a very, very powerful position. And look at the creep spread. It's starting to knock on the door of Stardust here. Yeah. There are maps where you can get the job done with sentries and blink stalkers, but look at Vani and look at that third base. It's so wide open. If this Mothership Core falls, I think he should start focusing on it. Instead, he was prioritizing the Void Ray. I actually think the Mothership Core would have been a much more important target over here. Uh, perhaps a small missed opportunity there for Red, but you know, the Vani, the low ground on the third base of Stardust, it's such a wide open area. If you want to cover that with force fields, you know, your sentry count needs to be 10 plus easily. And we do see Stardust trying to buy time here with the Zealot counterattack, moving in from the side, coming in with those Void Rays. Once again, they took a very nice trade before on those Hydralisks. Right. They're coming in, and this was really buying a lot of time for Stardust, but he doesn't have necessarily a big macro follow-up just yet, but it is pulling Red home. These Hydralisks haven't been able to deal with it just yet. Quite a few of them going down to the Zealots, and this Roach Warren getting low, but the Hydralisks are coming up. They're going to try and kill these Void Rays. 
Yeah, another photo now, excuse me, another time warp goes down that will actually save the majority of this Void Rage, will save the Mothership Core for now. But I do feel that Red has to start chasing these Void Rage now because Stardos had zero Stalkers a while ago, but the first Hydrolisk are out. Right now, Red did take a small supply lead. We're looking at 30 Hydrolisk, but suddenly we're looking at 22 Blink Stalkers. And during all this, Stardust has cleaned up a couple of those Creep Tumors as well. We all know Hydras are way more powerful on Creep than they are off Creep. This is kind of the fight where it has to happen for Red, but the Force Fields are very good. I think the Blink is quite smart there as well by Stardust, and he's going to clean up the majority of those Zerglings without losing anything. And the Hydras are still trying to push through, but that supply is so close now. Not many force fields left, but he does such a good job at segmenting off those Hydralisks. So many of them milling around in the back. Beautiful Blink Micro pulling back the weak Stalkers, and that supply count is getting closer and closer. Those Queens and Hydralisks are dropping down, and at the same time, a oh, big counterattack coming in the back. Uh, Sardis is playing this out very well, because he had to work with so little, but he's truly making the best of it. And out of nowhere, suddenly he was able to get 20, 30 Stalkers out. I feel that Red just gave him a little bit too much time, gave those Void Rays a little bit too much respect. I know how we often say you have to respect the Void Rays, but I actually think with a couple of reinforcements, he should have just tried to deal with those three Void Rays. And meanwhile, keep the pressure on at the front. Instead, the opposite happened. He was kind of playing the game that Stardust wanted him to play, chasing that army around over and over again while his own army is growing. This is a very, very ballsy blink there by Stardust, but I guess he feels confident enough that he could make it as most of the Hydras have been cleaned up. A couple of Roaches will be streaming in, but uh, I feel that Red has just lost too much from this point. Yeah, this is a hard position. The Roaches are still getting gunned down by this Immortal in the back. The Blink Stalkers are blanking on top of that Roach Hydra, pushing Red out of the game. He does have to type GG. The Stardust wins his first series of the day over here in WCS Season 2 Grand Finals 2-0 over Yulsta Krohn, also known as Red. Uh, solid play, I think, by our Korean Protoss player as he gives us a little tap on the back. He had to struggle for it. It wasn't easy, uh, but in the end, he was able to close it out, right? Yes, absolutely. It was just a very, very strong performance there. And I think it just came down to Stardust's experience in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, the ability to lose the third base, lose your center count. Often you say it's game over from there, but Stardust just adapted. He said, yeah. I've got some Void Rays out. What can I do with this? And he bought time with those counterattacks. He did those beautiful Zealot counters. He really opened up the opportunities, put Red on the back foot, and I think that just gave him that chance to get uh, in his comfort zone. I mean, like, I kind of have to eat my words because I really thought that first Zergling attack, I really thought it was perfect having got Red. I I thought it was a game-winning move, and I often feel it is. As a Zerg player, you just want to cancel that one time. But Stardust behind that, he really showed that you can still do a lot with very little. He didn't have a lot of resources, he didn't have a lot of units, but he still managed to re-establish his third base, still be aggressive as well, forced out you know, a couple of drones to morph into spore crawlers, picked off a couple of reinforcements, and above all, he bought so much time for himself, and that really allowed him to stabilize, and it went from five, six, seven stalkers to suddenly 22 plus stalkers. And that of course combined with a couple of good force fields. I mentioned it's hard to drop good force fields on Vani. Well, if there is one point, it's probably that little choke point there. Yeah. We have that little small little river in the middle. He dropped a couple of good force fields, was able to fight it with his Hydras. And just like that, he was able to close out the series. Uh, I think Stardust can feel pretty damn solid about this. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you get in that messy situation, but then to recover from it as cleanly as you do, that gives yeah. you confidence. Stardust wanted to come through this. He wanted the 2-0 win. He didn't really have to give too much away in terms of his builds, and I think he's very happy going forward into that next match, looking for that top eight, looking for that potentially to the top finals performance. Red, on the other hand, he's got to be, uh, you know, licking his wounds a little bit there. You said he wasn't too confident going into the no. match, but he does now have to play that loser's match. It is a much harder road from there to try and make it any further. Yeah, but it could also be two back-to-back -back ZVZs, and Red has always been very strong in ZVZ. So it's far from over uh, for both of these guys. Stardust is still going to have to work very hard for it as well. He, of course, will move on to the winner's match, where he will play against either Petraeus or Jadong. Uh, I think that's going to be played on the main stage later on today. Uh, last but not least, I still want to give a final shout-out to that little cannon. I thought it was very smart to shoot at his own pylon. Otherwise, he was alerting Red too early. Red could have cancelled it. Small things like that do matter a lot, but... Uh, you know, good series for Stardust, and I think that this is going to be it for WCS on this stream. Of course, you know, we'll be back tomorrow, but uh, this stream is far from done for the day as we're going to have a couple of Arkham matches from the Red Bull Battlegrounds later today. I'm very pumped to see what those matches will bring. I'm going to keep a close eye on those. A lot of fun. There's going to yeah. be a bunch of amazing matches. Players like Naniwara are down here to play, so everyone should definitely check that out later on.
Well, that is it for WCS from here. For now, all the other remaining games will be played on the main stage, at least today. But this stream, like I said, or this uh, stage will continue on later today at the Red Bull Battlegrounds, which you can follow at twitch.tv slash Red Bull Esports. And that is where the Archon tournament will be broadcasted. I believe maximum 64 teams will sign up for that. Today we're going to go through the open bracket. No, open bracket is kind of like an open pool stage play. And then the yep. winning teams will move on into a bracket. We're going to explain all of that and more later. For now, from WCS from this stage, I want to say thank you for watching. And make sure to tune into the mainstream. As currently, Paul is still playing against Marine Lord. And that is going on over there. So thank you for watching and see you later.